we have Dr. Chesarum, who we are very delightful, delighted that she's taken the time to speak to us today and talk to us about traumatic brain injuries. For a brief introduction, um, Dr. Chesarum is a consultant neurosurgeon in Nairobi, Kenya, with a subspecialty interest in skull-based surgery, um, utilizing both microsurgical and endoscopic techniques. Her other interests include global health, teaching, and clinical research, and was also Nancy's Neurosurgeon of the Month in November of 2020. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Chesarum to speak to us today. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. You can see I'm, I'm dressed up warmly because while you're having your summer, we're having our, our winter, which temperature wise is just a fine chilly morning in spring in the UK comparatively. Um, so yes, yeah, so I work in uh, Kenya, for those of you who may be familiar geographically, that's along the equator. And I moved back, uh, I grew up in Kenya, studied in the UK for my university. Uh, shout out to those who went to Southampton. Um, and then subsequently did my neurosurgical training in South London. And now moved back uh, to Kenya in September last year. And in the interim, I also did a global fellowship in Tanzania. So I'm gonna talk about traumatic brain injury. I'm gonna try and keep it simple. The whole idea is we finish earlier than, in than time and then you can ask me any questions, very open and very relaxed about that. So hopefully by the end of this, we'll have understood a little bit about the demographics, the management strategy, and a little bit about what the future needs to be. And when we talk about the future, I'm gonna try and do a bit of a comparison between my practice in the UK and the realities now that I'm back home. Um, so the demographics, the age standardized incidence is about 369 per 100,000 globally. That means that every year about 27.08 million people have a new incidence of uh, traumatic brain injury. The, the study that I'm looking here is the global regional and national burden of uh, TBI and spinal injury that's reported by the Lancet. So the Lancet have a group that look at the global burden of disease at intermittent um, intervals. So um, this was the 2016 data. So 27 million people, that's a lot. Put it into context, the UK has about 60 million people. So that's almost half the number of people living in the UK having a, um, a traumatic brain injury. And the interesting thing when I was reading this paper is the proportion that has the highest incidence was actually in Central Europe, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. I think that this might be because they were younger compared to the other European countries, but also have more complete data than other parts of the world, such as Africa, where you have 1.4 billion people, China and um, India, which have a similar population. The globalized age standardized prevalence, that means at any one time, the number of people who have a head injury is about 55 million people and falls and road traffic accidents are by far the leading cause. The, the cause of the TBIs will vary from location to location. So if you are within Kenya, which I would use as a um, surrogate for any low middle income countries, you will find that the average in the African continent is 18 years old. So most people are in the age group where they're playing sports, they're risk taking behavior, um, they're engaging in um, they're entering the workplace. And when you enter the workplace, you typically start from the bottom up. So it's more manual, it's more physical. Um, and these are the very age group that are more likely to have a suffer a significant head injury. They're also the, the age group that are more likely to be um, starting, you know, part of the economic work plan for the particular country. So we'll look at the effects of that on the wider community when, as we progress through this conversation that we're going to be having. And then the other thing that I really need to mention is that trauma is disproportionately a male disease. What do I mean? It doesn't matter whether you're working in a UK hospital or in an American hospital, trauma affects more men than women. And I think that's just to do with how we socialize in our genders. So men are more likely to play sports that have, you know, uh, high speed, high contact. So as football or rugby, um, they're more likely to drive fast, uh, more likely um, to have, you know, to have risk taking behaviors and also more likely to do the physical jobs that are more likely to result in injury. So if you think about construction, working in the Navy, working in the military, there's proportionately a higher number of men than women in those activities that are more likely to result in injury. 
So this is the map that demonstrates across the world. And um, I think when I saw it, the thing that really surprised me is, so the, the light, the, 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 the deeper the colors, so as you approach the red, that's the highest proportion uh, per population. And you can see you've got a range there around the Middle East. Um, I think that's because of fast cars. Um, uh, and I think that particular country that's really strikingly red in the middle there is Syria. And as you know, in 2016, Syria was facing uh, uh, and is currently still facing civil strife. So there's an element of war um, as a contributing factor. And then you've got a lot of the Eastern European countries and Central European countries lighting up. So that's a little bit about the World Cup in terms of, uh, let me just go back. Oh. Allow me to, there we go. So that's a, in terms of global aspects. What about in the UK? In the UK, it's a significant contributor um, to admissions in hospital. So if any of you are aspiring to work in a &E, and any of you are aspiring to work in neurosurgery, uh, a significant part of your take will be people who've suffered head injury. Now, in my personal experience, a lot of them are people who've been drinking um, and so they were drinking and driving, drinking and got into an altercation, uh, drinking and had a fall. And, and I remember working through my a &E, um, uh, rotations, particularly on your average Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, you sometimes would have just your entire take compromise after midnight compromising of head injuries. And what you need to learn as you're going through your training is which head injury you're going to keep in hospital, which head injury you're going to be sending home with a caveat, and which one is definitely going to be admitted and transferred to a neurosurgical center. So we're just now going to look at the investigating of the TBIs. And I'm going to break it down to your clinical workup, your radiological, your biochemical, and electrophysiological. So Clinical workup is what happens when you see the patient. Prior to the work uh, done in Glasgow, uh, we didn't really have a very good way of describing the conscious level of a patient. So to one person, the patient would be a bit drowsy. To the other one, they'd be in complete coma. And thanks to the work of Graham Teasdale, who subsequently got an award from the Queen and got knighted, we, he led the team in Glasgow to develop this Glasgow Coma Score. And that's a very useful way of describing someone's level of consciousness. And it looks at three main components. It looks at your eye opening, your verbal response, and your motor response. So the minute you work in, an, in, a, in any environment really where you're assessing neurological patients, you'll be asked about the GCS. The eye opening was divided into four spontaneously, like you and I, hopefully, to speech, um, to pain or no response. The verbal response makes several assumptions. The first is the person can hear you. The second is that the person can understand you in the language that you're talking to. So uh, the challenge with this is that it doesn't work if somebody speaks a different language or somebody has reduced hearing or is deaf. So it has a five point scale. The top one is you're oriented in time, person and place. Uh, the, the second one is confused, inappropriate words, incomprehensible sounds, or no response. <clears throat> of course, the, this assumes that you're not um, mute for whatever reason. And then the last one is a motor response. And the motor response is the most important. And the reason is, is because anatomically, you have the higher cortical functions, and then you have progressive loss of function until you have brainstem death. So somebody who obeys commands, which is your top one, must not only be able to hear you, they must be able to understand what you're saying, and then they must be able to follow your command. Now you can see why there may be a couple of challenges. If there's any problem with my hearing, it's gonna be difficult to score me a six. If we have a language barrier, I may not understand what you're saying. And then if I have any other injuries that are distracting, for example, if I have a spinal cord injury or limb injury, I may not be able to execute the, the, the task that you've given me. So when you're assessing somebody, you've got to bear that in mind. So sometimes the task can be very simple, like, can you stick out your tongue? Um, because th that assumes maybe if somebody has a cervical injury, they're, then they're not able to do that. So, uh, and, and then as, as you progress to no response, it highlights 
the significant injury to the cerebral cortex, your higher cortical function, so that by the time you get to abnormal, flex, uh, abnormal flexion and extension, you're really testing the remnants of brainstem function. But if you're a pediatric patient, of course, the 15 point scale is not going to work very well. So for children, we have the patient is awake, the patient uh, responds to verbal stimuli, patient responds to a painful stimuli, or the patient is unresponsive. So if you have a pediatric case, use the full score. If you have an adult who can hear you and whom you share a common language with, then the Glasgow Como scale is very useful. Now, when you look at the 15 point scale of the uh, Glasgow Como scale, then you've got to break it down a little bit further. So it's considered that if you have a GCS of 13 and above, that you have a mild head injury. And that if you have uh, between 12 and eight, you have a moderate injury. And if you have less than eight, then you have a significant severe injury. And the Glasgow Como scale must be taken at a point where the patient is sufficiently resuscitated. We're discussing TBI, but TBIs don't tend to occur in isolation. So if somebody has an airway problem or if somebody has, uh, is hypoxic or hypoglycemic, then the GCS may be affected by those factors. And if you're re recording, you need to record that. You, if you also need to do serial measurements. So the, the usefulness of a GCS is not just the initial uh, assessment that you do, but the ability to repeatedly repeat the test to see if there's a progression. If I could give it as a correlate, it's like measuring your weight or your height over time. Uh, one point, you know, one measurement is useful, but actually of greater significance is serial intervals uh, or, or interval measurements that give me the trend of how you're performing. So somebody who comes in with a GCS of 15 and then within half an hour has a GCS of eight, has a, has a, has a very profound injury or progressive injury that, is, um, that we need to be addressed very quickly. Somebody who's a GCS of 15 and three days later is a GCS of 14, still has an injury, uh, but the severity of the intracranial damage is on a different scale. The other thing that it also tells you is that the initial GCS is the GCS that you get when you get your primary injury. So your primary injury is whatever happened to you at the point of the event. And then there's a the secondary insult. And the secondary insult is when we don't mitigate against evolving physiological derangement. So hypertension, hypoxia, hypoglycemia, um, or mass effect, those will then cause secondary insults and result in a drop in your GCS level. The next bit is about imaging and we'll discuss broadly three modalities, but really I want you to focus on your CT scan and your MRI. In most situations, you will be required to look at a CT scan. Why? CT scans are cheaper than an MRI. Therefore, they're more readily available. Most of the hospitals that you work in have an, a CT scanner that works 24 hours a day. Not so for an MRI scanner, which is much more expensive to run because of the, the helium gas that it requires to function, the specialist skills that you need it, and the very strong magnets that are required to, continue, to, to keep it you know, in service. So a CT scan is, uh, it also has the advantage of, because it's an it's a much more open uh, modality. It, it, um, it's more tolerable to the patient. So you can imagine when somebody has a uh, head injury, they're anxious, they're stressed, you want to monitor them. So a CT scan is, is the investigation of choice. Someone in the audience might be wondering, but why not an X-ray? An X-ray is only useful for the bone. And therefore, because the brain is, uh, is re largely radio-opaque, um, sorry, radiolucent, you won't get much information if you do an X-ray. You need to do a CT scan because it gives you a 3D reconstruction and allows you to see the slices very well and, 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 and construct a better image about the state of the patient. Interestingly, for those who like history, what are some of the earliest CT scans were done in Atkinson Morley, now part of St. George's Hospital. Um, and uh, it, it's a pretty profound contribution by British neurosurgery to the wider um, uh, neurosurgical community around the world. So a CT scan will show you mass effect. So if I take you through the different slices on your extreme left, you can see a discontinuity of the skull. So it'll show you fractures. And fractures are most uh, significant if they have communication with the, 
with, with the skin and, and there's a break in the skin. So therefore they're con considered compound fractures and very high risk for infection. Very significant in the brain because the brain is an immune protect site. Um, also, it can result in, in um, avulsion or blood vessels or tearing of your sinuses. So if you see a fracture, please make sure you analyze the skin and underneath it. If we look at the CT, other CT scans that we can see, on your top left, you can see an extradural. An extradural means that you have bleeding between your dura and the skull. It typically happens in younger patients because the dura is much more pliable. And the best thing about recognizing an extradural is that it's early recognition and surgical treatment uh, results in very good outcomes. The typical presentation of an extradural hemorrhage is somebody who lost consciousness, regained it, and then subsequently loses their consciousness. Typically a young person, typically a high impact injury. The second one is a contusion where the energy has translated through the brain and causes shearing and parenchymal damage. The challenge with the contusion is that it can expand or it can cause edema around it, such as shown in that scan, where if you can appreciate that the, uh, you can't really see the ventricles very properly. And that means that the brain is swelling. And we'll come back later on and discuss the Mundo Kelly. The third one at the top is the one that confuses a lot of people. And that is where you look at the scan, doesn't seem to show you much information, but your patient is clearly not well. And that highlights the limitation of, an, of a CT scan in interpreting the clinical status of a patient. So I'll come back to that. The bottom line on the, on the left, you have a subdural hemorrhage. Now a subdural hemorrhage happens between the brain and the dura, so it's within the subdural space, but it typically denotes that the energy at the point of impact travels through the brain. So you can see not only is there a bleed near the skull, but you can see little areas of hyper density, all that white area, and that brain is damaged. That brain is, 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 so this kind of patient doesn't do as well as an extradural. In an extradural, the brain has not absorbed the shock in quite the same way. The energy has managed to travel and dissipate. Whereas in a subdural, the energy has been absorbed by the brain and there's been damage. The middle one on the left, uh, uh, the, the bottom one is a subarachnoid or intraventricular hemorrhage. Now subarachnoid intraventricular hemorrhage, the patients typically tend to be well, but there is a global damage to the brain. Um, and so the patient, you need to monitor what other derangements and electrophysiological dysfunction this patient will have. Um, sometimes you, you can have a subarachnoid and intraventricular hemorrhage coupled with a DAI, which I discussed at the top. And we'll come back to that later. And then sometimes you can have diffuse swelling. You've got significant disruption of blood supply into the head. Blood can no longer get into the head. And we'll come back to that in the Monroe Kelly, which we'll discuss la later. And the brain is, undergoes an acute inflammatory and in, you know, uh, uh, resulting injury, and it swells. And when it swells, no more blood can come in, and the patient typically has a poor prognosis if it's a complete um, uh, cerebral uh, edema. So the, the second modality we look at that is an MRI. An MRI is great for amount of detail that you can get. Indeed, the amount of information we're getting from MRIs is in a way exceeding our ability to clinically correlate it. So we need to still process some of that image. But I'll look uh, if you look on your left, you've got uh, different kinds of images and you can see that there, there's a hyper intensity, that lighting up that shows you this is an area of damage within the cortex. And then when you look on your right, this is called an SWI, susceptibility wedging images, which is very good at showing you where there's shearing of those neurons. And when there's shearing, it means it's a disconnection. If you think about it like your IT system, if your wire is suddenly connected, just because the cable looks up intact on the outside, the ability to conduct information is impaired. And this is where we talk about diffuse axonal injury. CT doesn't really pick it up. An MRI will give you a beautiful picture of how extensive the shearing of axons in the brain has been. And this is a good corollary for how the patient will do later. So there are three main grades of diffuse axonal injury. Grade one is really mild. So you just see a little bit of, um, uh, you, you see a little bit of damage in the, in, in, in a bit globally in the cerebral cortex, maybe a little bit in the corpus callosum, a little bit in the brainstem. Typically this patient has had a very brief loss of consciousness or amnesia and they, they rapidly improve and they're well. 
Grade three, on the other hand, it's very severe. There's significant lesions in the brainstem. And these patients may sometimes may not regain consciousness. Sometimes, even if they regain consciousness, they will have significant long-term neurocognitive disability. And so in traumatic brain injury, if your imaging, your CT scan typically doesn't fit the patient, it may be time to prepare the, yourself and the patient psychologically for a long neurorehabilitative period, which may not necessarily result in complete healing. So we've looked at the CT and the MRI. There's an intermediate where you can use perfusion imaging. And what you're saying is the blood, which is a transport medium for the substrate that are necessary for the brain and the oxygen, if we looked at the blood flow globally, uh, we tend to just look at the circle of willies and we look at the MCA and the ICA, but we can look at it in much more detail, the microarchitecture. And what this particular scan is trying to show us is if you see the top half, it's particularly the top one on the left, there's barely an injury that you can appreciate. But when you look at the uh, perfusion, the cerebral blood volume on the, you can see the, the blue hue in the circled area. That area of brain is significantly uh, has it significantly impaired um, perfusion. And that correlates even as you go through the day. So the first one is admission and the last one is day 15. By day 15, you can see the evolution of the contusion in your scan. And that is cor corroborated by your uh, cerebral blood flow. So once again, it shows us that there are limitations in the interpretation of the imaging that we have, and we must correlate to the patient and understand that we may not have all the information at presentation. In terms of biochemical, we have two broad groups. One is metabolic dysfunction. So you've got looking at your glucose, you're looking at other metabolites that are common in the brain and cellular issue. And there's a very good paper to, to look at that. And the second one, which is quite important is your pituitary dysfunction. So your pituitary is like um, part of your relay for making various hormones and organs function. And that because it's the pituitary sits in the cellar, uh, which is a small cave-like structure in your anterior fossa, and it's connected with the hypothalamus with very friable blood vessels. When you have a head injury, the shearing forces, you know, you have the coup and the contra coup, the traveling of the brain can result in the dysfunction in the blood supply or um, actually physical damage to the pituitary. And this group of patients will have a whole host of endocrine dysfunction, be it their thyroid dysfunction, cortisol growth hormone. Um, the most important one to look out for is your cortisol, because that's part of how you wake up and have energy and you have your immunity. So it's worth exploring this in, in, in various patients who are not progressing, who have multiple symptoms to ensure that they don't have that uh, pituitary dysfunction. So when it comes to metabolic dysfunction, there's a paper at the bottom there that I've, I've alluded to, which looks at predictive markers of various metabolites. Now, this is still a work in progress. So some of you through your biochemistry will recognize some of these metabolites. They, they are increased when you have a, a cerebral injury. We, what we don't know for sure is whether it is a consistent predictive marker of longer term outcome. So in, in, in isolated cases, for example, an elevated glucose or an elevated SB100 has been associated with poorer outcomes and worse mortality. But the tests have not, and the research has not reached a period where we can say these are direct bedside tests that are routinely applied. So for those of you who are considering doing um, your intercalated degrees, there's a whole host of research that you can get involved in when it comes to TBI. Ah, I've realized I have a typo. That was meant to be electrophysiological uh, in terms of depolarizing waves in TBI. So as you know, the nerve, you can look at it as just the cells, or you can look at it as how it conducts the electrical signal. So your electrical potential, which you learned in, from A-levels, et cetera. So the brain is constantly firing and sending messages from one, you know, one neuron to the other. And that synaptic change allows the transmission of information, instructions, processing of information, uh, storing of memory, and the self-actualization of your person, personality in terms of your emotions. What has been noticed is head injuries not only are a risk factor for seizures, but, but by studying the depolarization, how the electrical potential moves, you can predict areas where there is progressive injury or where you can anticipate the next area of metabolic dysfunction will be. 
Um, and this is becoming a bigger area of research. Certainly when I was there at King's, they were doing a lot of work around depolarizing waves. And I came across a very interesting video that I wanna see if it will play. Uh, oh, it's refusing to play. Let me just see if I can get back to it and try and play it. So that's normal brain waves, and suddenly you have a depolarization and a damping down. And these waves are associated with brain dysfunction. They've been aptly described as a tsunami of brain wave uh, of, the, of the brain where they cause dysfunction. So that's an area where there's more work to be done in doing what you might call translational research. How do we take all this information that we know and make turn it into instruments or standards of care and protocols? So how do we manage these patients? It depends on the severity. So the vast majority of traumatic brain injury patients are not in hospital, they're in our community. These are children who bumped their heads, our grandparents, even ourselves after a spot injury, where you're otherwise well. But they, or rather, maybe I should say, you don't meet the threshold for admission in hospital. Many of these patients continue to have longer term um, clinical symptoms. They may complain of headaches, not feeling generally well, they might have nausea. That's what called post-concussive syndrome. And we'll look at them a little bit later. So the absence of meeting the threshold to admission does not in itself mean that you are not affected by the traumatic brain injury event that you've had. Then you have a cohort who will be monitored in the ward and those will go to critical care. Really the reason why you go into hospital is you require a period of monitoring or treatment that cannot be economically or efficiently be delivered at home. Yes. And what we're looking for is, uh, what we're aiming to do is ensure that you have metabolite and electrolyte normalization. In traumatic brain injury, we talked about glucose, but the other, so the other salt that is often um, uh, deranged is sodium. So many patients either develop cerebral salt wasting, where literally the brain nitriuretic peptide in your brain says, you know what, we've got enough salt, and you start to lose it uh, in your urine. And as a result, you become hyponatremic. And the treatment is to replace the fluid and the sodium. Sometimes later on, some people develop syndrome of inappropriate ADH. So antidiuretic hormone from your, you know, your pituitary and your hypothalamus say, uh, no, actually, we don't have enough sodium. And they conserve sodium, but disproportionately conserve water. So you become hyponatremic because you're effectively waterlogged. And the treatment for that is... Um, is to fluid restrict, but you've got to be very careful that you can differentiate between cerebral salt wasting, where you're dehydrated, and SIDH, when you relatively have an excess of water retained in your body. Sometimes through the pituitary, you can have significant dysfunction that results in um, your, your, you, you, um, you having diabetes insipidus. So you release too much, um, you have a lack of flow of antidiuretic hormone. And instead of conserving your sodium, you pee it out and you become very uh, dehydrated. You lose a lot of water, some sodium, but mainly water and your sodium levels goes really high. The other thing that can happen is oxygenation. So when you have an injury in any part of the body, the body responds by increasing your metabolism. The increase in your metabolism means that you need increase in oxygen because the brain principally uses oxygen for its metabolism. So sometimes the problem isn't really that you're hypoxic, but relative to the amount of, well, you are, well, maybe I should just look at different terms. It isn't your amount of oxygen that you breathe in, the 21%. It's how much that your brain needs. So you may have cerebral um, hypoxia because of the increased metabolism in your brain and the need for greater oxygen uh, delivery. 
sometimes the problem is a primary respiratory failure. So you either have a lung contusion or you have a pneumothorax um, and something has affected the gas exchange. And so in that case, you are primarily really hypoxic and that has a knock-on effect on the brain. So you get admitted because you need to normalize that. Talked about, about fluid balance and sometimes the management is surgery. So this is where we come to the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. So the Monroe Kelly Doctrine really works like this. You got a box, you got three main components. You got your CSF volume by 150 mils for 10%. You got your blood, so blood in your arterial or in your venous circulation. And then you got your brain parenchyma, which you'll be glad to know is the, the largest proportion. So your 80% brain. Um, if you add anything more to that box, something has to leave to make room for it. That's really is what the Monroe Kelly Doctrine is about. So in, if, if your brain expands, either because there's a bleed within it, so you have a hematoma, or the contusions cause a reaction so that the brain becomes edematous, initially you'll displace your CSF, and then the blood will struggle to get into your head, you know, because of the increased pressure. So your, your carotids and your, your um, your carotids and your vertebral arteries are, are pumping and against quite a lot of pressure. So you find some of these patients become quite hypertensive because they're trying to overcome the pressure within your cranium. So your surgery will offer a solution by um, creating room in the box. So either you put in an extraventricular drain, so you put in a drain and let the CSF drain, or you'd say, I have a focused mass lesion, so I'm going to evacuate that. So I'm going to do a craniotomy and evacuate the hematoma or bar holes. Or if it's a contused part of the area that's relatively non-functioning, we'll remove the contusion. Or alternatively, you'll open the lid, yeah? So you provide, do a decompressive craniectomy. And on your left is an example of a decompressive craniectomy. You literally raise the skin flap, take off the bone, open the dura, and just let the brain swell. Now, is it a good idea? There's been a lot of umming and eyeing in the scientific literature about this. And there are times when we did this, sometimes when we did it not. But the biggest study you need to know about is the rescue ICP, which is coordinated from Cambridge. And what it said, so you've got two groups, the surgical group that were offered decompressive craniectomy and the medical group who were managed by other techn techniques, such as putting you to sleep and putting you in a thyropentone coma. There was a lower mortality in the surgical group, although, the compensation was there was a higher probability of surviving but being significantly disabled. So the red is being a permanently vegetative state um, and the orange and the, and, and the yellow show other significant forms of um, uh, disability. However, at 12 months, even those who had been severely disabled, there was a proportion that improved in their overall function. So the argument at the moment is in otherwise uh, physiologically fit people, we should offer decompressive craniectomy uh, as an early strategy for managing, rest, you know, for managing the ICP once it becomes established that the standard initial medical therapy is not working. So get a traumatic brain injury, what happens to you? How long will you stay in hospital? This is a very good study from the Canadian audience that looked at what your GCS meant for, uh, whether your GCS and age could predict how long you've been in hospital. And on the left, you can see with 11,189 patients that, um, so actually I should explain, there were two things that they looked at. The index is the first time you came with your injury and the total means that you had subsequent presentation to hospital. So in all the age groups, it clearly shows that people have a further episode of admission, not just the initial episode. So they, they clearly come back for something else. But the, the lower your GCS, the more likely you are going to stay in hospital for longer. Worryingly, the younger you are, the longer you'd stay in hospital with a lower GCS of three to eight. At least that's how it looks at an initial. But the underlying all this is the reality that if you're over 65, you have a higher mortality, the lower your GCS. So if you're younger, you'd stay in hospital for longer. If you're older, you're more likely to expire. And on the right, it then shows you where in the hospital you'd spend proportionally most of your time. And the lower your GCS, the more likelihood of you being in a critical care space, which also has implications for cost and the level of intensity that you need. So 
what are the outcomes if you have a moderate to severe TBI? So there, remember the moderate is anyone with a GCS less than 12, and a severe one is anyone with a GCS less than eight. This is looking at the work by CDC, Center for Disease Control in the US. You're 50% more likely to have further decline in your health and function five years after the injury. And you're 50%, so one in two people who survive this are more likely to return to hospital at least once. And you shorten your life by nine years. And 55% of the survivors were unemployed. Um, you can see that there's a 50 times more likely than the baseline in the, in the community for seizures, more likely to get infection. And then when you look at the bottom half, um, you find that there's a 29% of uh, people who are using illicit drugs and uh, quite a number of the people stayed at home. So they, they didn't really return to work. So it says 55% of survivors were unemployed. And remember that we said that trauma is a young person's disease. So there's a lot of people who lose their um, ability to work. So I think in the earlier bit, I talked about mild TBI doesn't necessarily mean mild and nothing. So the, the, um, the cloud there are what are the, some of the symptoms that all these patients can get. Amnesia, headache, fatigue, um, irritability, feeling dazed, uh, depression, uh, insomnia, personality changes, anxiety, nausea, um, ringing in your ears. So there are very many side effects that may not be apparent on the scan and may not warrant an admission, but are quite a real experience to, to the patient. And when patients have this, they need to be reassured, they need to be acknowledged. And in some cases, they need supportive therapy. So they might need anxiolytics, they might need uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. They may need a referral to a psychiatrist or uh, patient support groups. In the UK, you're privileged enough to have um, various charities that take care of uh, brain injured patients. Um, you've got to think about the ability to interact in their normal social activities. So if you have a head injury, you've got to tell the DVLA that's bottom line. If you have a significant head injury, you've got to let the DVLA inform. Uh, no. So this might affect your ability to work, it might ability, affect your ability to go on your placement, it might affect even your job if your job is directly linked. So if you think about trained drivers, if you think about um, uh, bus drivers, the, they, they have a much higher threshold for retaining their license. So it, it's not a benign thing. And then return to your regular economic activity, depending on what it is in, within your community. So how are we going to improve care? So we need to look at prevention, triage and early resuscitation, critical care protocols. We need to have head injury MDTs, which are now becoming much more common within the hospitals that you work in. So get the opportunity to spend time in a neurosurgical unit, come and uh, try and spend some time with the head injury team. And then we need rehabilitation and integration. So this particular bit of the talk, I'm just going to compare a little bit about my experience having now come back home. So patient-centered TBI care must include the pre-hospital rehabilitation and the hospital treatment. And, they're co and then over, overarching all that is how data drives care, government policy and health financing. The typical spend in a patient, uh, for a patient, for one of you, you and I in the UK is probably about 3,000, 3, 3,500 uh, um, pounds per year per person. If you come to African countries, Malawi, for example, spends about $17. That's probably going to be about 13 pounds. And Kenya spends about $38 per person. So delivering care for the same group of patients is really difficult if you're already starting in an underfunded position. So for, for, for places like Kenya, prevention really is key. Um, we've got a young population, some male disease, many homesteads are primarily cared for by male breadwinners, and we need to address the occupational hazards. We have very rapid urbanization and all the construction work that comes with it, but we have low healthcare personnel to healthcare needs. So Kenya has about um, 9,800 doctors that are registered in the, on, 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 um, uh, on the doctor's registry. I bet that Birmingham alone has more than 9,800 doctors. So you have a difference in our ability to cope with the same amount of work. We only have about 37 neurosurgeons for a population of 50 million, and there are 350 neurosurgeons for a population of 
uh, 60 million in the UK. So that even if we didn't have, it doesn't take much to saturate our services because of the differences in our, um, uh, in our health resourcing. We also don't have a centralized ambulance service. So most of our patients are brought in by Good Samaritans or by family. So if we're to improve things, uh, it's, it's not taking me back. Uh, If we're to improve things, then we need to address the, also the challenges in the, in, in the hospital care. So I'm talking about the staff. We need to have a uniform language. So when we sing the anthem, we all agree what the anthem is going to be. And, and that means that there are no surprises when you're singing the anthem. The same is true for when you're taking care of patients in hospital. You're going to learn about advanced life support skills. You're going to learn about advanced trauma life support skills. These are very important. And you typically have set into hospital transfer policies that are reviewed um, by various bodies within the NHS. And that has saved lives, but we don't have the same here in, 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 on the continent. And I'll just show you a picture after that. So we need rapid access to skilled theaters. We don't have a centralized blood service. So many of our blood donations are dependent on family and friends. So there's a difference there in how you can quickly resuscitate a trauma patient. And most of our uh, equipment and implements are imported. So COVID-19 has really kiboshed a lot of our uh, supply chain, yeah? And then there's a question of who should fund trauma care. Should it be the family? Should it be the government? Should it be religious organizations? So this is the ATLS body when they were celebrating um, uh, 40 years. And interestingly, ATLS was started by a surgeon who had an accident with his family, some of whom unfortunately passed away. And when they arrived in hospital, he realized that every member of the family received a different level of care. So he introduced the ATLS to standardize it. And what you can see is that South America and North America, Europe, Australia, and Southeast Asia is very, uh, has training centers. I don't know about whether all the people get access to it, but if you look at the African continent, apart from South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, um, uh, Egypt at the top, most of the continent is underserved um, in terms of access to this tra training. One, it's expensive. So the cost for an ATLS course is about 38,000 Kenya shillings, which is about 256 um, pounds. But 256 pounds can sometimes be the nurse's entire monthly salary or can be a significant portion of the junior doctor's salary. So we've got a problem with affordability. We also had a limited number of instructors. If you go to the Royal College website, you'll find hundreds of courses that are available. Whereas in Kenya, we have less than uh, 20, uh, maybe about 50 instructors for 50 million people. So it's not possible for us to run our clinical services, uh, our, our academic institutions, and also run regular ATLS. And then the applicability of the protocols. If the protocol is written very Eurocentric, American-centric, how much of that can we apply to the realities on our ground? And then there's challenges of rehabilitation. Kenya has only one spinal rehabilitation service. So we don't have any head injury neuro rehabilitation center for the uh, 50 million people. So who should provide this rehabilitation? At the moment, we have little, little few teams. So I've got an OT and a physio that I work with, but it'd be good for once um, to get to a point where as a country, we'll have something more centralized. The, the opposite in the UK is that patients get screened in every neurosurgical center and referred to an appropriate uh, neurorehabilitative network. And that network decides where is the best place to get your care. And they're very uh, fantastic centers. But even then, those centers are not sufficient for the amount of traumatic brain injury in, in the UK. And then data. So most of the data that is collected about TBI is not collected on, the, on, our, on our continent. Most of it comes from Europe and America. And there is an African proverb that says, until the lion turns to tell the story, only the hunter will be glorified. So the, the stories about academic and research science on the continent are typically through the lens uh, that is not necessarily African. So our data is fragmented and we have uh, other issues to do with that. So when you're working in the privileges of Nancy, which can do research together through SBNS, uh, we, we hope that one day we will get to that position where we can run research like that in the same way. 
So very good models of TBI data, if you ever wanted to look up, is the Brain Trauma Foundation in the US, Center TBI in Europe, and the Cambridge TBI Research Group. And of course, there's a lot of more research that's happening now on traumatic brain injury through various networks in the SBNS. So uh, the goodness with this data is that it's in real time. It tells you whether something has an effect on the patient. It allows people to uh, modify their practice at a local level. And one day we hope that we will be in the same shoes. So if you're a student and you're looking for a research project, my suggestions would be to contact your local neurosurgical unit or your local neuroscience uh, department and find a small piece of the bigger pie and uh, to get involved in and see just how amazing opportunities you've got. So that's where I work. I uh, just wanted to say thank you very much. On the top left is the hospital and on the top right is the university center that really just got opened last year. We're, we're a young, uh, um, uh, the hospital has been running since 1963, but we're a young university. We only started being a university in 2004, um, but we would welcome anyone who wants to come and visit and learn a little bit more about where I work. It's a private university. And so the realities are probably a little bit different from a public institution, but nonetheless would be fantastic to host some of you at some point. Thank you very much. And I'm open to questions. Wow, thank you so much for the for the talk. We really appreciate it. And I don't know about everybody else, but I can definitely say I learned a lot. So very much appreciated. Um, we do have some questions that did come to me. And I hope you don't mind if I read them out so you could answer it for us. So the first one I got when I scroll up. Um, what are the facilities like in Kenya in terms of accessibility to CT head scanners in comparison to the UK? I know you've worked in, in both places. So it depends where you are. Um, to be honest, the hospital that I work in is very much uh, similar to a UK hospital. We've got an ANE that has ATLS. We all have to do ATLS if you work within surgery or anesthesia. Um, I'm in the capital city, um, which has maybe up to 5 million people. And we have more than 10 hospitals that can receive you and process you. The issue becomes, what happens once you're outside the hospital? Because we, as I said, we don't have a centralized ambulance service, mm -hmm. but we have 24 hour CT scanners in the city. But uh, Kenya is um, three times the geographical size of the UK. So most of the doctors are in the urban areas, yet most of the population are in the rural areas. And as I explained, we, you know, our, our doctor population is probably just what Birmingham alone has. So if you, it's more than just having a city scanner. We have city scanners now, we have put, we're divided into 47 counties. So if you think about the counties in the UK, I don't know how many there are, or the shires. So we've got 47 counties and all of them have city scanners. Not all of them have um, a radiologist readily available to report it or an appropriately trained radiographer. So not all of them can run 24 hours a day. Uh, we have of the 47 counties, we have six counties that have neurosurgical doctors and facilities. So we have more than 41 counties where we still need to introduce uh, better trauma services. So what happens is compared to the UK, there are many centers in, the, in, in Kenya where general surgeons will do the um, uh, initial trauma uh, surgery. They'll do the, you know, the trauma craniotomies, they'll do the hydrocephalus uh, management. Um, so when you, when you get, I think the only equivalent for training is those of you who train in Scotland, there's what you call the rural surgeon. So we, we have a lot of surgeons who do a little bit of many different things. You know, they could do a cesarean on a good day. Yeah. Well, thank you for the answer. So I do have someone in the chat who asked what the difference was between a contusion and a hematoma. The easiest way to describe it is a hematoma is a collection of, it's a blood clot where a contusion is when you have damage to the brain parenchyma. And although it contains specks of blood, it isn't primarily an organized clot. A hematoma is purely an organized clot. A contusion is bruised brain. Thank you for that. So another question that we, we have here. Um, so what would you say is your approach towards thromboprophylaxis in TBI patients? And this could be mild, moderate, or severe TBI. So we're very pro uh, thromboprophylaxis. So they're largely divided into two. You've got your mechanical and you've got your chemical. So within the institution that I work in, most people get their TED stockings and we've got access to the pneumatic boots. 
And um, if in areas where I've worked with anonymatic boots, at least they get the thromboprophylaxis socks to help. Um, in terms of the um, chemical, the most commonly available is low molecular weight heparin. So the Clexenzio and Exoparins. And now increasingly we are getting the new NOAC. So your Rivaroxaban and Apixaban, which are in some cases possible to use, particularly in patients where you know, they don't like needles, um, uh, uh, and they're otherwise stable, you know, planning to take them to theater. Increasingly, the NOACs are becoming much more affordable, even in our setting. Thank you. And um, the final question, that, uh, this is from my understanding. Um, so in regards to reducing the burden to the healthcare team in Kenya, um, do you believe it will be more challenging in regard to improving prevention of such injuries, of TBI injuries, or would it be um, more difficult to improve rehabilitation? Uh, wow, that's a very good question. I think that prevention is where the golden um, uh, opportunities are because uh, we have a fixed number of hospital beds. So for example, I'll tell you something very interesting that's happened. You guys have been in lockdown. I think now you've had your freedom day or something like that. So since March last year in Kenya, we have had essentially a nighttime curfew. So every day from 10 o'clock, everybody's got to be home. What does that mean? The pubs don't really open late. Uh, you know, we don't really have a lot of big sports activities and stuff like that. And the amount of patients with trauma has completely gone down. I mean, I mean, we've gone from operating on trauma cases every day to asking ourselves, when is the last time we saw a trauma case? So we don't get as many as we did before. So prevention has really changed the dynamics of our practice. And what's the good thing about that in the short term? So the reason why we did that is that it creates beds in hospitals. If we don't have the young men with trauma, then we've got oxygen and fluids and beds and staff for people who may have COVID. And we've had a much lower burden than other parts of the world. Uh, but we, that's why we've been able to do it. You know, we've been able to contain the disease. Uh, I wouldn't say completely effectively because every leader in the world who said that has then been um, proved wrong. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't jinx myself, but it certainly has had a, a much lower volume of COVID. So the question then becomes, when we open up Kenya, how are we going to make sure that we don't have as many accidents? The rehabilitation one is, 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 is it, we will have to think of novel ways of how to do that because we, we're not going to be able to fund inpatient rehabilitation like the rest of the world. So what are the talents that we have? Well, we've got a lot of young people. We tend to live in big families. Um, and so most of, even our long-time patients with trachees and stuff like that, most of them go home and are taking care of their family. So there was a model for mental health in, I think it was Zimbabwe or Malawi, where they taught grandmothers to do counseling. So we're probably going to have to adopt something similar where we take people in the community and teach them rehabilitative skills and then form cohorts of rehabilitation groups. We're gonna to have to think differently about providing that care. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I had one that just came in to me directly just now. Um, I hope that's okay. Hopefully this should be the final one. And I wanted to ask it because it seems like it's from someone who's an aspiring Kenyan medical student studying in the UK. And they wanted to like gain a better understanding of what they can do to boost their chances of getting a neurosurgical placement here. Just repeat the question. The patient, where is the, where is the question? So the, the person who asked the question is an aspiring Kenyan medical student and they're an international student. So they found they wanted to know what they can do to boost their chances of getting a neurosurgical placement in the UK. Uh, okay, so the S, I'd say the first thing is join NANSIG. It didn't exist in my time. And actually NANSIG makes a huge difference because the first thing is you get, a, you get little tasters. So go to the NANSIG career days. Wherever you are in medical school, try and do a neuroscience related project. Now, if you can't get in a neurosurgical department, you could do, for example, um, uh, traumatic brain injury, for example, in AE, or you could look at neuropsychology effects of a neurosurgical problem, or you could work with a neuro oncologist and do some neuro oncology work. Think broadly about how you're going to get some research experience, uh, present at conferences, get your face seen around town. And then when you're choosing your F1, F2s or your special study modules, spend some time in a neurosurgical unit. You've got 32 choices. So try and do that. Um, join groups like NANSIG, Incision, uh, try and get involved in some of those publications and then keep at it. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. 
Um, and yeah, thank you so much for, for doing our talk today. I'll take any more questions if you've got some. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think that's all that's been sent so far. If anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to, to send them in. But uh, Ms. Chesurum, can I just quickly ask? Uh, yeah. What where is better for you uh, to do neurosurgery here or in Kenya at home? I mean, you, you, you're asking me to choose between my parents. <laughs> so I, 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 I didn't know anything about neuros. Well, the only neurosurgery I knew about before I came to the UK was about, um, what's his name? The neurosurgeon from the US who wrote a book, Think Big. And to me, really, I thought neurosurgery is careers that happen to other people. So coming to the UK and uh, getting exposed to so many different things in the NHS was just so amazing. I also learned a lot of skills that I use here. And I got to meet, the, the NHS is a bit of a melting pot. You will meet people from so many different cultures who will teach you so many different things. Um, and so I am, I'm, I'm very privileged to have had the opportunity to train in the UK. Coming back home is also quite an interesting thing because I speak the local language, I get it, um, and I've had good training. So I'm really enjoying my practice now. Um, but I don't know if, you know, so both of them have been a very fundamental part of who I am. Um, yeah. If I'd stayed in the UK, I'm pretty sure I'd have still continued to enjoy my strawberries and cream. Uh, but I'm here and I'm enjoying my, you know, the living by the eco the sunny side. Everything in life gives you an opportunity you should just take up. Oh, amazing. Thank, thank you so much, Ms. Chesaro. Okay. Um, you should come and visit. Oh. <laughs> that's what i was going to ask i'll probably i'll probably be in touch <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly i would encourage anyone to go and work in other parts of the world um and what i mean by that is it's fantastic when you go to the states or you go to canada or australia but you actually have a lot in common already so why don't you try south america or go to southeast asia you know uh or come to africa or go to the middle east and do something that's just takes you out of your comfort zone on many levels. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you so much. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people gonna be wanting to, to jump in that offer as well. So sounds good too. Um, I think that's it. I don't seem to have any more questions that have come in so far. Um, if there's any last minute ones, please send them like right now so you can add them in time. But if not, um, thank you again so much for the talk. We really appreciate it and we learned a lot and I've, a lot of people just wanted to say thank you. They've been sending thank yous either to me or on the chat. So we really appreciate it today. Thank you so much for the privilege. Thank you. No well, that concludes our webinar today, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and yeah, we'll be, we'll be ending shortly.